Next, we've got uh, Joshua Allen. Uh, Joshua is a lecturer and PhD candidate from the uh, Deakin University. So uh, both Joshua and Stephanie are, are PhD candidates from Deakin University in a uh, deteriorating patient uh, focus. So well done, Deakin University. And Joshua will talk to us about can we predict met calls. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Thanks, Arthur. And thanks, Daryl and the organisers for the invitation. Um, Daryl is one of my supervisors. So. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank my other supervisors, Judy and Julie and Liliana, and acknowledge that I got some funding from Deakin University to um, undertake my project. Um, Daryl asked me to come and he said, I want you to talk about your lit review and your results, um, and we're calling it Can We Predict Met Calls? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get to the end and hopefully have some sort of answer to that question, but um, essentially my study came out of... Um, this quote from, from a paper that Daryl and Ken and um, Imogen Mitchell put out a few years ago that, that states that a, a deteriorating patient is one that moves from one clinical state to a worse clinical state with an increased risk of morbidity, organ dysfunction, etc. Um, but the question that came out of that for me was, well, what are these clinical states? We know that cardiac arrest is bad. We know that patients going to ICU is bad. But what happens before that? What happens before someone gets to a MET? Um, and also, can we shift to predicting and preventing deterioration um, rather than waiting for it to happen and then recognising and responding to it? Um, so a bit of a little review here. In hospital cardiac arrest, um, rarely sudden or unexpected. We know that now. It's often the culmination of a period of physiological deterioration. Um, you're about a 50-50 chance these days to get ROSC after a cardiac arrest. Um, and then the figures are improving, and I haven't included the most recent paper in here. The figures are improving on whether you get home or not, but it's still not a good outcome. So if you deteriorate to the point of having a cardiac arrest in hospital, um, the outcomes are not good. Um, and the introduction of um, rapid response systems seems to have had an impact on reducing the frequency of in-hospital cardiac arrests and mortality associated with them. The next step that we looked at was unplanned ICU admission. So the mortality for an unplanned ICU admission, someone who comes to ICU after being a patient on a hospital ward, um, around about 50%, which is about one and a half or two times higher than an ICU patient who comes via ED or via theatre. Um, and the thought is that suboptimal ward-based care that precedes the ICU admission is a key contributor to this mortality. Um, there's also some evidence that earlier admission for deteriorating patients to ICU produces better outcomes. Um, and again, the introduction of the rapid response system standard in Australia has been associated with a reduction in cardiac arrest related ICU admissions. Uh, and then we've got all this data around um, physiological indicators of deterioration, so vital sign changes. Um, but we still know that patients who deteriorate to the point of getting a MET review have a hospital mortality of around 30%. Um, and at the bottom end of that, so for a patient who meets uh, urgent clinical review or medical review criteria, the mortality is still about 12%, which is about four or five times higher than base hospital mortality. Um, and at the other end, a patient who requires a MET review and has um, some sort of end-of-life care plan or limitation of medical treatment has a mortality of about 50%. Um, and there's been various systems developed for recognising and responding to deterioration in all sorts of different forms. So what came out of the lit review was that there's these stages of deterioration that, um, when you unpack it, becomes fairly clear. Um, at the bottom end is an in-hospital cardiac arrest, which is very bad. Um, before that, you get a deteriorated patient, which is um, identified by severe physiological changes, um, pre-arrest changes, um, may result in unplanned ICU admission. Then if you track back a little bit further, there's deteriorating patients who have mild or moderate physiological changes. Um, this is probably where you fit in when nurses have a concern about the patient that hasn't yet manifested in changes in vital signs. Um, and maybe this is where you look at early unplanned ICU admissions. But my study um, was really looking at what happens before that. How do we identify who's at risk of deteriorating before they start to manifest with signs of deterioration? Um, I'm a critical care clinician, um, but I have a passion for acute care, um, and particularly acute care nursing. And so from, from my acute care nursing lens, um, 
One of the things that's come out of this whole rapid response system is an emphasis on vital signs as the way to recognise clinical deterioration. Um, statistically, these indicators are good, but not great in terms of predicting outcomes, um, particularly as you track back to the urgent clinical review criteria. Um, it's created increased demand on limited uh, critical care resources. Um, and essentially, rapid response systems are reactive safety net system. Um, and for an acute care nurse, um, we need to be starting to thinking about what can we do about deterioration before we get to needing the safety net. Um, so we wanted to work out whether we can use patient characteristics and other factors that were present at the time of the hospital admission to stratify the risk for MET review within the first 48 hours of the same admission. And so we collected data retrospectively, um, initially started with 12 months data and then went back and collected another couple of years. Um, and we were looking at adult acute care admissions that were for greater than 24 hours um, to a university affiliated teaching hospital in northeastern Melbourne, no prizes for guessing where. Um, this first part of the study has actually been published in um, the European Journal of Internal Medicine, um, but essentially what we conducted first was a retrospective cohort study to identify what were the risk factors that may go into a predictive model for identifying patients at risk of a MET call. Um, what we identified was a number of factors that were associated with MET. Um, so having uh, multiple emergency admissions in the previous 12 months, um, having multiple comorbid conditions, um, specifically related to alcohol, um, heart failure or COPD. Um, if you came in under the colorectal surgery unit, um, you're two and a half times more likely than um, general surgery to have uh, a MET call, um, and you can see the other units there. Um, interestingly, medical patients um, were the least likely to have a MET. This is controlled for all the other factors. Um, emergency admissions were more likely. If you came in between midnight, or if you're admitted between midnight and seven in the morning, you were more likely to get a MET. Um, and if you came during winter um, or summer, when all the new clinicians start in the hospital, you were much more likely to end up with a MET too. So from there, we were pretty excited. So we went back and got some more data from the hospital to develop the predictive tool. Um, we divided it into a training and testing data set. Um, we used uh, um, selection criteria to increase the number of outcomes we had in the sample. Um, if you want to know more about the technical stuff, you can talk to me about that later. Um, but essentially, we ended up with a, um, an ROC curve that looks something like this, so around about um, 0.72 uh, in the training data set and 0.70 in the testing data set. And at some stage during the um, exploratory analysis, we'd worked out that um, emergency admissions had a very different profile to planned admissions. So we split them and we had a look, and this was the calibration plots for the emergency admissions. And so we're really, really happy with this because it meant that our predicted values and our observed values were pretty much spot on right across for emergency patients. Then when we did it for the uh, planned admissions, um, we got calibration plots like this. So we were quite disappointed and we scrapped the planned admissions and thought we'll just focus on emergency patients um, because the tool clearly was not predicting well for planned admissions. Then when we looked at um, the distribution of the predicted MET in the emergency admissions, what we got was something like this. And essentially what this plot tells us is that the risk for patients who actually end up with a MET against those who don't end up with a MET is almost the same at the time of admission. So the tool predicts uh, the risk really well, but it doesn't discriminate particularly well between patients who got a MET and those who didn't. So very, very disappointed here. Um, this table basically just shows that um, if we were to put the split at um, a predicted risk of 0.11, um, you would have to look at, um, you would have to evaluate 20% of your admissions to hospital um, and classify them as high risk um, to recognise only around about 50% of your actual MET calls. So um, as a tool, uh, it wasn't going to work very well at all. So why didn't it work? Um, we moved on to another study after this, phase two of my PhD. I actually went into the wards and spoke to 
um, experienced acute care nurses and asked them about what happens between the patient coming into the hospital and them calling the Met. Um, and what came out of that is that there's significant variability in care between the time of admission and the Met call happening. Um, they feel very strongly and they're able to describe incidences where quality care actually prevented the patient from deteriorating. Um, but they also described a lot of examples of where they used the MET to address not just failing physiology, so not just patients with vital signs that were going the wrong way, but uh, times where they couldn't get the home team to come and make a decision about the, the patient's care, where they couldn't get the home team to come and have a conversation with the family about the direction of care. Um, and so they were using the MET not just for, for as I said, for physiology, but actually for these other system failures. And so probably what's happened a little bit in our study is that the MET's a very noisy outcome. It's not just about physiological factors, it's a whole lot of other things. Um, possibly also we we're using predictive variables that were good but not particularly great. So to answer the question, can we predict MET? Um, maybe. Um, possibly with more specific data for different types of patients. So for example, if you're focused on developing a tool for just orthopaedic patients, perhaps you might get some data that was specific enough to predict METs for those patients. Um, clearly there was a difference between patients who came in as an emergency admission and those who came in as a planned admission. And probably what's happening for the planned admissions is they're being screened for all these risk factors before they even hit the hospital. So there's clearly different cohorts of patients. Um, Possibly prediction of MET with the inclusion of some more clinical and diagnostic parameters. So we specifically chose just to use data that would be easily available to clinicians at the very first time of admission. Um, but maybe that's not enough. Maybe including some more clinical and diagnostic information is necessary. Um, and perhaps the focus needs to be on sp predicting specific conditions or syndromes. So MET's the a result of sepsis or met as a result of respiratory failure rather than met as a whole. So next steps perhaps is in developing multiple tools for predicting deterioration for use across a whole lot of different patient cohorts. Um, there's definitely potential with the machine learning real-time prediction. Maybe if you've got a computer system that's big enough in your hospital um, and an EMR and um, someone to do all that for you. Um, I think emphasis on systems of care for prevention rather than recognition. From an acute care perspective, um, looking at MET not as an averted cardiac arrest but actually as an outcome in itself um, is something that I think is worth considering. Um, and identification of alternative outcomes that are sensitive to prevention of clinical deterioration from a ward perspective. So what can we look at that says this has been good quality nursing care that's actually stopped deterioration from occurring? Um, and I think there's probably some potential to explore the etiology of MET reviews. So um, clearly there are MET reviews that happen because of patients failing physiology. Um, but from what the nurses were telling me, there are also a lot of MET reviews that happen because of failing teams um, and failing healthcare systems. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Just wondering when we get away from looking at phenotypes and start looking at genotypes, maybe, who knows. And uh, next speaker is um, 